I'd like to uh, call this uh, markup to order. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on legislation to modernize energy infrastructure, build a 21st century energy and manufacturing workforce, bolster America's energy security and diplomacy, promote energy efficiency and government accountability, and other purposes. And I'd like to recognize myself for a five-minute opening statement. First of all, I want to thank the Democratic staff and Republican staff and members on both sides of the aisle for really focusing on this legislation. This is a st still an ongoing uh, process. We're not where we want to be. And it's the first major energy bill that we've had really since 2007. Much of the nation's energy policy dates back, in, as a matter of fact, to 1970 and is rooted in assumptions of scarcity that are no longer relevant in light of rising domestic energy production and declining imports. Parts of our energy policy are badly out of date, and it is beginning to hold back progress. Now, there's a lot of bipartisan support on what we're going to be voting on today. In fact, just about everything we're voting on today is not very controversial at all. And we have some provisions in there, for example, that Mr. Rush wanted. We have some provisions that Mr. Welch wanted. We have some provisions that some of our members wanted. And basically, everybody's signed off on them. So this committee print today is reflective of the accomplishments and compromises agreed upon at this point. Uh, and I won't go into all the details of, of what we're doing here, but I did want to take a minute to focus on some issues that are so important. They've got to be addressed, but they're not in this uh, bill yet. But hopefully we uh, report this out of subcommittee today, and as we go to full committee, maybe after the August break, and we'll continue to work on these issues, we can address some of these other uh, provisions as well. Uh, one of them, for example, uh, as many of you may know, there's an outright statutory prohibition about the federal government using any fossil fuels, uh, getting away from fossil fuels by 2030. Well, the president's always talked about an above the, uh, an all, uh, uh, all of the above energy policy. And we don't know where we're going to be in 2030, but I don't think it's a right policy for a federal statute to say the federal government cannot ever buy fossil fuels for its needs. Uh, there's not any other entity in our society today that that is a rule for. Uh, we know that uh, fossil coal prices, for example, uh, there, there's really less demand for coal, so it's really not about coal, but it's about flexibility. We also hear about uh, building codes coming out of the Department of Energy. And they don't write these codes, they try to moderate them, but we hear more and more that they're trying to decide and pick and choose which uh, materials, which technology would be used. Uh, Blackburn and Schrader both had a bill to address that, to provide more of a balance on it, and we'd like to see that addressed in here. Uh, we have a real problem, in my view, with the uh, uh, mandatory capacity markets and uh, the impact of our dash to renewables, which is very important. But what impact does that have on reliability? What additional tools does FERC need to deal with some of those issues? We should also be looking at hydropower modernization. We should also be dealing with the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. Those are some issues uh, that uh, we, we, we need to be looking at, and I'm not even mentioning uh, the export of uh, crude oil, for example, is another issue. So I think we've made remarkable progress to this point, and it would not have happened without a number of people working together. Many members on the Democratic side have come to me, as well as Republicans, and are asking for additional pieces included in this. I mean, uh, Congressman Kennedy was talking about to me about a special problem that they 
have in the Northeast and relating to FERC, and I'd like to work with him on that to help out in that situation. So we have a, <clears throat> many opportunities, and because of the goodwill that I do believe that exists between our members on both sides of the aisle and the staffs, I'm hopeful uh, that we can bring this all together in a more comprehensive way uh, when we come back uh, in September. So uh, despite all the difficulties, despite the philosophical differences, despite geographical differences, I think we're moving in the right direction and I'm very uh, excited about our opportunity. So with that, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to begin by expressing my appreciation to both you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Pallone, for this love manifesto that we are about to engage in uh, this process by which the negotiation of this discussion draft have evolved and I expect will continue to develop. Mr. Chairman, uh, your remarks are well taken and I um, know that we can't just get along here on this uh, subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, as we begin to go down this unsteady path of working on a bipartisan, comprehensive energy package, there indeed was a certain amount of skepticism and doubt uh, that I believe was expressed by many on the part of uh, the members of this subcommittee as well as uh, coming from the broader public. For it had been quite some time since we had embarked on an, an intentional demonstration, manifestation of bipartisanship in order to find common ground and to work on solutions to issues that will help move our nation's energy policy forward. However, Mr. Chairman, as we continue along this process, you and Chairman Upton have indeed been very responsive to our concerns, to the concerns that Ranking Member Pallone and I have brought up in regards to process and procedure. And I am pleased with the good faith that has been demonstrated by you, Chairman Upton, and the majority staff in working with our subcommittee staff, our full committee staff, to try and, try and resolve both substance and procedural problems, uh, the issues that are leading us, us up to today's subcommittee markup. I really applaud the staff on both sides because over these last month, month and a half, they worked tirelessly, sacrificially uh, to get us to this point. And again, I applaud their uh, very, very, uh, their every effort and their very intense uh, involvement uh, in this process. With that said, Mr. Chairman, I think that the discussion draft that we are marking up today is an improvement over the legislation that was initially unveiled. But there remains much work to be done as we move forward through this uh, legislative process. Mr. Chairman, this kind of reminds me of uh, my grandmama back down in Georgia uh, preparing the Sunday meal. And she would, uh, we would run into the house as youngsters and say, Grandma, Grandma, that cake smells so very, very good. She said, don't get too excited now. It smells good, but it ain't done. So, Mr. Chairman, we know that uh, I'm looking forward to when this cake gets cooked and it's done and the American people can delight in, its, uh, in, the, in the taste of uh, this legislative cake. 
Mr. Chairman, there are some specifics that I will continue to press for uh, to help modernize the grid and assist low-income consumers who might otherwise be impacted by upgrading the nation's aging pipeline uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is one of the issues that I'm, I'm concerned about. While there's been some dialogue in this area, I look forward to holding more substantial discussions on, on funding so that at the end of the day, we will have positive, meaningful, tangible benefits that warrant uh, the minority's support for the final package. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, in the area of energy efficiency, it is extremely important that the final bill moves the nation forward in that regard. Uh, there's been some real progress, Mr. Chairman, made in some provisions that I could not personally support previously, such as the furnace standards, which have been improved through stakeholder negotiation. I look forward to continuing to work to find common ground on the remaining outstanding provisions that were included in the initial energy efficiency draft, including repeal of Section 433, the Energy Star warranties, and the building codes provision. I think we all, uh, additionally, Mr. Chairman, realize that there must be much work uh, left uh, on resolving some of the larger issues from the initial uh, discussion draft, including sectional, sections on authorizing cross-border projects, changing the process for LNG exports, and licensing by hydropower projects, just to name a few. Mr. Chairman, there are also, there are also subcommittee members from our side who do have uh, priorities they, they would like to see included in the bill as we move forward to make this a true bipartisan uh, effort. So Mr. Chairman, while today's markup shows that we are in fact making real progress, we must be cognizant of the fact that much work remains and the final product is far from assured. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, with that, I yield back, and I want you to know that uh, from our side, our members are committed to being uh, robust participants uh, in the days ahead as we move and march toward getting uh, this legislative package before the full body, before the full Congress, and on the President's desk. Thank you, and I yield back. <clears throat> well, Mr. Rush, thank you very much for that. And uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we're going to take an important step as we work to ensure that our energy policies reflect our game-changing resource abundance and fulfill the nation's energy potential in the 21st century. No one said this effort would be easy, but today, this subcommittee begins advancing what I'm proud to say is the first attempt to put together a broad bipartisan energy package in nearly a decade. We started the process back in July of last year, announcing the beginning of a framework that we called the Architecture of Abundance. We've worked in a bipartisan fashion to refine it into four titles, Modernizing Energy Infrastructure, 21st Century Workforce, Energy Security and Diplomacy, and Energy Efficiency and Accountability. I particularly want to commend Subcommittee Chair Whitfield and Ranking Member Rush for their commitment and dedication to working through the process. We held seven legislative hearings and received testimony from nine different government witnesses, including the Secretary of Energy and 38 private sector organizations and experts. Also led a bipartisan delegation to Europe a few weeks ago that included Ranking Member Pallone as we met with a number of European officials to discuss areas of mutual cooperation around energy security. I know that we're on a bipartisan roll after 21st Century Cures Act two weeks ago on the House floor. Cures was about common sense reforms to outdated medical research policies. And I believe that what we're discussing today is an equally sensible effort to modernize energy policies stuck in the energy security mindset of the 70s. 
While a lot of work remains, I am pleased that today's draft on the, uh, starts on the right foot with broad bipartisan support. While it does not encompass the entire universe of issues on the table, the staffs and members will continue their discussions over the next couple of weeks in order to advance a broader package when we return after Labor Day. There are several issues that members want to see addressed, including LNG and oil exports, more predictable permitting, rules for cross-border energy infrastructure, provisions on electric reliability and wholesale markets, hydropower reforms, and efficiency. I also believe that this legislation must go further to protect our nation's recyclers and paper products industry. Mr. Pallone and I have committed to working to include several of the Department of Energy's recommendations from its quadrennial energy review into the final draft, including changes to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, state grant programs for grid and pipeline infrastructure resiliency and modernization, and updates to the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. In addition, I want to reiterate my commitment to pipeline safety, which means holding FIMSA accountable for implementing the last round of safety reforms enacted by this committee and working with our friends on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee to, in fact, reauthorize the Pipeline Safety Act before it expires at the end of September. Working on many of these remaining issues will be challenging, but this markup helps to move the process forward to form a bipartisan foundation for some of the tough decisions ahead. By embracing our abundant energy resources, we can deliver so many benefits to folks in Michigan as well as across the country. Affordable prices, greater security, boost to jobs in the economy. I want to thank the committee uh, for their hard work in getting us this far. I also want to commend uh, Senator Murkowski for the work that she's doing on the other side of the Capitol as we try again to work together and, as Mr. Rush said, get a bill to the president that he can sign. So uh, let's say yes. Uh, we can agree to move forward and appreciate uh, the work of everyone here on the committee. I yield back. Jim yields back. This time recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, and also Ranking Member Rush for holding this subcommittee markup. The legislation before us today represents an initial attempt to move forward on comprehensive energy legislation. It represents the combined efforts of members and staff on both sides of the aisle. Included in this legislation are provisions drafted by Representatives Eshoo, Doyle, Green, McNearney, Welch, and Ranking Member Rush. Many of these provisions passed the House last Congress. Chairman Upton and I have had discussions about this legislation, and we've reached agreement on a few key points. First, all provisions at both subcommittee and full committee need to be agreed upon by both sides. That's the only way for us to move forward, both at subcommittee and full committee. That means that during August and into September, members will have the ability to participate in the process and offer their ideas and suggestions for consideration. Second, we agreed that we would need to find funding for infrastructure programs. We all know that we need to repair, replace, and upgrade our nation's aging infrastructure. Deteriorating leaky gas pipelines are a public safety and environmental hazard, as well as wasteful and inefficient. That's why I've proposed, and Mr. Upton has agreed, that funding will be included in this legislation to help accelerate this process. One way to do so is to provide assistance to low-income households served by utilities who are engaged in the costly process of replacing and repairing their natural gas distribution lines. We will look to provide actual dollars to achieve this goal. In addition, it's past time that we modernize our electricity grid. That is why we've also agreed to fund a program to help states and local government upgrade outdated electricity infrastructure in a way that enhances reliability and resiliency. And both of these ideas for funding are based on the DOE's Quadrennial Energy Review recommendations. This bill is a reasonable start, but it's by no means complete, and there are provisions desired by members on both sides of the aisle that have been postponed for further discussion at full committee, and some provisions in the subcommittee mark are in brackets, and I have concerns about some of these. In particular, I note that both section 11, sections 1108 and 4123 appear in brackets. Section 1108 involves FERC in forward capacity markets in a new way and requires further study. Before we can agree to that section, we need to hear more from the regional transportation transmission operators, I should say, and independent system operators who would be affected by it. Section 4123 relating to DOE's efficiency standards for furnaces is a bit different. I do not think we need legislation on this issue yet. 
and we should let the regulatory process play out. And the language in the print represents an agreement reached by the stakeholders, so I will not object to it at this time. But we can't and, and really should not wait any longer for a furnace efficiency standard. Finally, let me um, mention the area of hydroelectric licensing reform. The current set of provisions await further discussion, and a number of our members have been working to develop proposals that would help push us forward in this area, and we'll continue to work on those proposals. I'm willing to support this legislation at this point because I believe it holds the promise of a bill that we can all support at full committee, but it's by no means guaranteed. Compromises have been made on both sides of the aisle, and further honest efforts to reach principal compromise will be necessary as we move forward. So I look forward to working on these issues with my colleagues. Again, I want to thank uh, um, Chairman Upton for, you know, for his cooperation on this. You know, as he mentioned, uh, we're really determined in this committee to be bipartisan on as many things as we can, and uh, I agree with him that the momentum that came from the SGR and cures and TOSCA reform uh, should continue, and hopefully this will be a way that we can do this similar things on a bipartisan basis and, in a, and, and significant things, hopefully, uh, with regard to energy. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Jimmy yields back, and I would like to remind members that com pursuant to committee rules, that all opening statements will be made a part of the record. And uh, are there further opening statements, I recognize the gentleman from uh, uh, Texas, Mr. Olson, for three minutes. I thank the chair. There is a lot of good in this bill. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rush, for all the hard work you've done so far. I'm happy to see that we're moving the ball forward on things like international energy cooperation and protecting our energy infrastructure. Also, like Mr. Rush, I believe that funding the next generations of jobs in the STEM field is crucial. But I hope that our work continues. We keep working to reach consensus to go further. For example, I think it makes sense to tackle LNG exports and infrastructure permitting. We have work to do on things like appliance standards and building codes. I'd like to focus my remaining time on a section that is in the bill, Section 1102. It fixes a conflict between energy reliability and environmental laws. If that sounds familiar, it's because my good friends, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Green, and I have been talking about this thing for years. This is a minor provision, but it fixes a major flaw in existing law. Our power plants get to choose which federal law they will violate when a power crisis hits. When a plant is ordered by the DOE to run during a crisis, that operator should not have to pay EPA fines for doing so. This is the hypothetical. It's happened before. It could happen easily once again. We aren't trying to circumvent federal laws or ignore the EPA. We're talking about common sense, limited response approach to an energy crisis. And that is why everyone from FERC to two energy secretaries has endorsed fixing this glitch in recent years. And that's why the core of this bill has passed our full committee and the full House in the 112th and 113th Congress without a vote of opposition. Let's make the third time a charm. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Olson. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. McNerney, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you uh, and Chairman Upton uh, for your work, as well as Ranking Member Pallone and uh, Mr. Rush. Uh, we've got to a good point here. This isn't just a message bill. We actually have both sides want to do something, and we're willing to work together to get it done. 
I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including bipartisan, provi bipartisan provisions that I've worked on with my colleagues, Mr. Latta, Mr. Kissinger, and my Grid Innovation Caucus co-chair, Ms. Elmers. These include Section 1104, 1105, 1106, 4113, and 4121. Hopefully, we can identify additional opportunities in this bill to enhance grid reliability, investment in transmission and distribution, grid optimization, and the integration of technology and other systems of, to support our nation's dynamic energy system. We need to address the energy water nexus, which is the discussion draft does touch upon, recognizing the link and importance of energy and water will pay a critical role in the years ahead. I will be working with Mr. Lada on this related to water sense programs and with Mr. Kissinger on implementing innovative energy water technologies mirroring a bill that we introduced yesterday. There are important issues that are not a part of the discussion draft that we must continue to have a constructive dialogue and one of these issues is hydropower. Hydropower is critical for many Western states, including California. It's a form of clean energy that is cost effective, can help our goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improve grid reliability. There are common sense principles that we can agree on and that will help address some of the concerns that we've heard in testimony before this committee. Improvements to licensing of non-federal hydropower should provide resource agencies sufficient time and resources at the beginning of the process to fulfill their missions. This will benefit all parties involved and reduce the hurdles that we often see at the end of the process. The licensing process can be more effective and economical. This can be done by having federal and state agencies work together to complete environmental reviews collaboratively and concurrently rather than sequentially. This will help eliminate duplication reduce cost and improve timeliness. We must also enhance accountability and oversight and make sure that the principles outlined in EPA Act 2005 are implemented and use this intended by Congress. I look forward to working with Ms. McCork Rogers on this issue. Finally, the draft does not address climate change. Moving forward, the bill needs to have provisions to reduce all forms of greenhouse gas emissions and address climate impacts. This legislative process has been productive and I urge my colleagues to continue in a bipartisan fashion. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm gonna be brief. I'm gonna address one issue uh, that I hope we can see as we move forward. It's, it's based upon the 2007 uh, energy bill and, and a flaw that was addressed in that bill, which deals with uh, heating and cooling elements and the, um, the effective date based upon when a product is installed rather than when it's manufactured. So imagine a heating and cooling company, small business, mom and pops, usually that's in my, in my area of the country, they're family-owned businesses, and they have, they have heating and air conditioning elements in a warehouse but the law says the effective day is when you install, not when it's manufactured. So if the, if the standards change, they have a sunk cost that they can't recover because they can't move the product. So I, I hope we can address this uh, simple solution and make addressing uh, the, the effective date actually being the manufactured date on the product so then we can uh, kind of get this uh, uh, really a burden off the small family businesses that will be you know, having these uh, elements in their warehouse. And with that, uh, um, I look forward to moving forward and I yield back my time. Thank you very much. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Tonko, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure you were hoping the uh, committee would be a bit farther along on an energy bill, but negotiations take time. We all know that. So I want to thank you for giving us more time to discuss the many important issues contained in the discussion drafts that emerged over the past weeks. I understand our work will continue with the intention of bringing a bill to the full committee sometime in September. I imagine there are some groups that are disappointed by what is not yet in the bill we will consider today. And I understand, Mr. Chair, that you remain open to including additional provisions as we move forward. 
several of us are engaged in an ongoing discussion with stakeholder groups on language related to hydropower licensing, and our intention is to continue working on this issue. I appreciate having the additional time to continue these discussions. I am hopeful that we can come to an agreement on a provision that can be supported by all stakeholders before the full committee takes up the bill in the fall. I still have concerns about some of the provisions in the bill that we, are still, that we will mark up this morning. I am pleased that the language amending the Federal Power Act in relation to capacity markets has been pulled pending further discussion. Although the text from Section 1208 of the discussion draft was removed, we still have a placeholder in this bill. It is now numbered Section 1108. First, I do not believe our subcommittee has done nearly enough oversight of capacity markets and how they are operating to come to a consensus about what, if anything, is not operating properly, let alone whether the, the best path is to address any identified problems to the changes to the Federal Power Act. I certainly did not hear anything like a consensus emerge from our hearings on this topic among the different stakeholders who appeared before the subcommittee. I am continuing to talk with leaders and experts in my home state of New York and in my region about that language. I hope we can come to a better understanding of the intent and the possible impacts of the language in this section and in Section 1107 before we move forward in September. Again, I do thank you for removing the language from the bill so that we can pursue this topic, uh, topic further as it relates to both Section 1108 and Section 1107. I am disappointed that the bill still includes language that interferes with the rulemaking underway to strengthen the standards for non-weatherized furnaces for residences and mobile homes. This uh, rule has been under development for a number of years, and it has been over 25 years since these standards have been strengthened. The interest groups on either side of this issue have been negotiating with each other, with the Department, and through the courts, for that matter, for quite some time now. The technology is well ahead of this policy change. I believe any remaining issues can and should be resolved through the ongoing rulemaking process. Further delay of these standards simply results in consumers using and paying for more natural gas than is necessary to heat their homes. I intend to support the bill today, but I am supporting it based on any optimism that we can incorporate additional provisions that are more focused on energy issues of the future the nexus of energy and water, achieving greater energy efficiency, increasing the proportion of energy we derive from renewable sources, and expanding our commitment to the manufacture and the use of clean energy technologies. This current draft is not very forward-looking, and although the draft's stated intention is to modernize energy infrastructure, it does little to achieve that goal. The bill virtually ignores the relationship between energy and climate and it appears to define energy security primarily in terms of benefits of expanding markets for oil and gas. That sounds more like income security for the oil and gas industry than energy security for our United States energy consumers. I think we can and we should do much better. I came to Congress because of my belief that we need a comprehensive, forward-looking national energy policy. I have come to realize what a tall order that is. Energy issues are still fundamentally regional in nature. We do not yet have a national consensus on energy policy beyond our recognition that we need energy and that we need it in an affordable price. But the price of staying the same energy course that we have traveled since the early 1900s is growing. We need a transition, and I hope we can facilitate some of the transition in this bill as we move forward. So I thank you, Mr. Chair, and our Ranking Member Rush. I thank our General Chair Upton and our Ranking uh, Member Pallone for moving this process along. I look forward to continuing to work with you, your team, and the other members of this committee to develop a good bipartisan product. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for three minutes. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me say that um, I think the work product before us uh, is the product of uh, bipartisanship. Um, I participated last night in a um, reception, uh, uh, 10 year anniversary of the 2005 Energy Policy Act. Uh, John Dingell, uh, Jeff Bingham, Senator Jeff Bingaman on the Democratic side and myself and Senator Domenici on the Republican side were the, uh, the four senior leaders in a bipartisan, bicameral basis of that piece of legislation. 
Uh, it was very similar in the beginning to this. Lots of folks were upset about what wasn't in the bill, and some people were upset about what was in the bill. Um, it passed the House 200, with 275 votes. It passed the Senate with 74 votes. It's still the basic energy law of the land. I think Mr. Rush and Chairman Whitfield have done an excellent job of, of, of seeing where the issues are. And uh, uh, I think the fact that we're having regular order, Mr. Chairman, is a good thing. That speaks well for uh, final success. Uh, I plan to vote for it today. There are obviously things that I'd like to see in the bill. Just like 10 years ago, I wanted to open up ANWR, and I was full committee chairman. I didn't get to do that. Uh, my friends on the Democratic side didn't want to do it, and the Speaker of the House, Mr. Hastert, and the Majority Leader and the Minority Leader in the Senate counseled uh, me against pushing it, and uh, I listened to them. So even as chairman of the committee and of the conference, there were things that I didn't get. Uh, I do hope at some point in time, Mr. Chairman, the one thing that I think would enhance this would be uh, H.R. 702, which would repeal the ban on crude oil exports. We have over 100 co-sponsors on that bill from 36 states, and it's bipartisan. Uh, it has the votes to pass the committee, the subcommittee, the House, and the Senate, and the President will sign it. But just like 10 years ago, there are still things, people that are have concerns about it, and you and Mr. Upton and Mr. Rush and Mr. Pallone have counseled against putting it in this package, and I agree with that, but I do hope we can move it as a standalone. But basically, Mr. Chairman, I just want to commend you and Mr. Rush for the um, process. Uh, things that last have to be bipartisan. Uh, what we are going to pass today is bipartisan. The things that we do at full committee will be will enhance that, and I do believe those of us that support the package at some point in time this fall will get an invitation to the White House uh, for a signing ceremony. Uh, energy is the bedrock of our economy. We're blessed with the natural resources. We're best blessed with the technology, and we're blessed with the uh, people to use those resources combined with that technology to produce the world's largest, best, most efficient economy it starts right here in this subcommittee with this bill, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to commend the chairman, the ranking member, and the staff on both sides of the aisle for their hard work on this legislation. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this is such a ter terrific uh, committee. Um, they've made tremendous progress toward developing bipartisan legislation that we can all support, but we still have a, a, a long way to go, in my opinion. Uh, in particular, I want to take uh, a minute or two to highlight some provisions that still require significant attention. First of all, there's a placeholder in this legislation for Section 1108 entitled Reliability and Performance Assurance in Mandatory Capacity Markets. Uh, the New York Association of Public Power reached out to me and I assume to Mr. Tonko as well to express their concern that this section could lead to the FERC establishment of a mandatory capacity market in New York where no such market currently exists. The capacity market operated by the New York Independent System Operator is different from those in other regions and so I want to make sure going forward that New York's system is prop properly accounted for in this legislation. I'm also concerned about the energy security and diplomacy provisions in Title III. Several sections in this site, including Section 3102, establishing energy security valuation methods, and Section 3103, developing a North American energy security plan, fail to take advantage of the expertise and resources available to us at the Department of State. State is the lead U.S. foreign affairs agency and the Secretary of State is the President's principal foreign policy advisor, of course. To the extent that this legislation considers things like global energy markets and the collective needs of U.S. allies and partners and coordinates with Canada, Mexico, and our energy security partners in the Car Caribbean and Central America, I think it is absolutely vital that the State Department plays a prominent role. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to address these and other issues as we work to improve this legislation going forward. 
Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Uh, Mr. Pitts, do you seek recognition? Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Alida, for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rush. It is important that we continue the good work that has been done this year to advance comprehensive energy legislation. And I'm pleased that uh, several of the provisions I've worked with the committee on are included in today's draft. The first is Section 1104, which amends the Federal Power Act to better protect critical electric infrastructure by enabling the federal government and private entities to respond to and mitigate grid security emergencies. The section also allows for the protection and sharing of critical electric infrastructure, information voluntarily between private sector asset owners and the federal government. While we have we, while we hope to avoid grid emergencies, it is important to prepare and have in place the procedures and the ability to share the information before an emergency situation occurs. The second is Section 4122, which requires the Department of Energy to recognize voluntary third-party verification programs to demonstrate compliance with energy efficiency standards. The Energy Star program will ensure manufacturer compliance with the program requirements under this language. Currently, DOE also requires that manufacturers spend millions of additional dollars to certify and verify product standards directly to the agency. Essentially, the same tests are conducted two times, tw once at taxpayer expense in the same facilities on the same equipment. This doesn't make sense for businesses or taxpayers, and I'm pleased to have this language included. While I'm pleased about many of the sections in the bill, I would have liked that this draft contained a provision that Mr. Welch and I have worked on, the Energy Star Program Integrity Act, which had positive testimony in our, effic in our efficiency hearing. This language addresses a recent threat that has emerged which could, po which could ultimately chill participation by consumers and manufacturers. Despite the continued success and oversight of the Energy Star Program, a gap in federal law allows private mitigation in addition to the EPA administered enforcement mechanism against a manufacturer when a product falls out of compliance with the program. Since the existing EPA oversight process has proven successful, our bill simply uh, codifies it. I look forward to working with the committee to have this portion included when we advance to full committee. Finally, I'd like to mention a provision that Mr. McNerney, McNerney and I have been working on dealing with the Water Sense program. I will not be offering this provision today, but plan to work with the committee going forward on this language, which was set out in statute the Water Sense program at EPA. As a voluntary program, this allows for a label that enables consumers to have more information about products which save water for their homes, yards, and businesses. I want to thank the chairman again for t holding today's uh, markup. Our country needs an energy policy that reflects the abundant energy supply that we are so fortunate to have. And I look forward to working to advance this legislation. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, holding hearing today. Uh, today's hearing is a accumulation of months of work between the minority and majority. The bill contains two provisions I'm especially proud of. The first, Section 1102, the Resolving Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflicts. I worked with my colleagues, Pete Olson and Mike Doyle, to draft this legislation, and this will be the third time we passed it out of the subcommittee. The language is common sense reform, and I'll keep the lights on for my constituents in Texas, so I'm pleased it will be included. The second, Section 2101 of the Energy Manufacturing Workforce Development Act. I'm pleased to be a original co-sponsor of this language. My good friend and ranking member, Bobby Rush, as many of you know, I represent a large Hispanic population in my district, including hundreds of energy development companies. This language will go a long way toward helping my constituents train for the jobs that surround our area. I want to thank Mr. Rush for his recognizing a gap in our workforce efforts and putting this language together. Overall, the bill is a good start, but we need to more than just start your language. There are three pieces of discussion draft uh, that I'm disappointed were not included. The first is LNG exports, the language that formerly discussed and was debated and negotiated to a point where we received a lot of part bipartisan support from the committee and on the floor. I look, uh, I know a lot of attention is turned to oil exports and we should look at that, but let's not fo lose our focus. LNG exports projects cost billions of dollars and generate thousands of jobs that cannot be outsourced. The second issue is the cross-border infrastructure language. We build pipelines safely, which includes strong oversight from PIMSA. 
We must protect the environment in case of disaster, and we should include provisions that provide funds for that cleanup. Just so there's no confusion about the language, I want to explain what it does. The bill would give statutory authority to the Department of State, FERC, and Department of Energy to permit cross-border infrastructure, including electric lines and pipelines. This bill would maintain comprehensive NEPA authority um, for the full scope of the cross-border project. This includes direct and indirect cumulative effects on the environment. The Congressional Research Service has reviewed the legislation and confirmed that the NEPA review applies to the entire project. This bill excludes the Keystone Pipeline. It includes a public interest determination by the lead agency. We, we're building r bridges, roads, highways, and now we must build pipes and wires as suggested by quadrennial, quadrennial energy review. The bill protects the environment review and recognize the impacts these projects have on North America. I hope we'll include this language. Finally, I want to address Section 433 of the Energy Independence and Security Act. While I support the development of oil and gas, I also am a big supporter of renewables. But it's unrealistic in this language to expect federal buildings to identify and select only renewables for power generation. It's my hope that we can reform the language of Section 433 to increase the use of renewables, but as also acknowledge the realities of the marketplace. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all the staff members on both sides who have put an enormous amount of work to this point. However, in my view, the work is just beginning, and I look forward to uh, supporting the bill, bill and yield back. Jimmy yields back. Are there members on the Republican side seek recognition for an opening statement? The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank uh, Ranking Member Rush for uh, for holding this uh, this uh, markup. I I want to first express my support for the legislation that we're marking up today. I'm encouraged by the direction that it's heading, and I'm hopeful that before the full committee markup, we can improve upon certain sections of this legislation through continued bipartisan negotiations. For instance, I believe that the language contained in HR 351. The LNG Permitting Certainty and Transparency Act would be an excellent addition uh, to Title III Energy Security and Diplomacy. Uh, this language will help bring certainty to the Department of Energy's review process for LNG export applications, create jobs, and continue spurring America's manufacturing comeback, along with providing a stable source of energy to our allies in Europe and around the world. Additionally, H.R. 351 has already garnered significant bipartisan support from members on this committee along with the entire House of Representatives. In fact, it passed the House with 41 Democrats voting in favor of it while receiving no veto threat from the President. With that kind of support, the inclusion of this language is common sense, Mr. Chairman, and it's reflective of this committee's energy initiative, that is, a bipartisan approach to updating our energy policies to reflect America's changing energy landscape. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to include this important uh, language within this bill. I thank you for the time, and with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. This time, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this subcommittee markup represents a, a, a good first step for this bill. Uh, we've been able to find common ground on a number of measures that will reform and improve our policies at the federal level. And there's some much needed changes here. I'm pleased, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, that the bipartisan provision on grid reliability that Mr. Olson and Mr. Green and I worked on for years is in this bill today. And uh, it's my hope we can continue to iron out some of the other provisions included in the discussion drafts and do so in a bipartisan way. Mr. Chairman, our country's energy landscape has changed dramatically in the past five years. And we can't or shouldn't just stand by and watch this incredible change. Uh, we need to take steps uh, to ensure that our country is producing affordable, cleaner power for our constituents, that our nation's energy sources are secure and resilient in the face of cyber attacks, terrorist attacks, severe weather, and yes, global warming, and that we are filling these uh, positions with good, high-paying jobs uh, with, for, with uh, people working here in our country. Um, our country's abundant natural resources provided us with an incredible advantage at, at, at its beginning uh, when it was called the New World and continuing through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, our ingenuity and hard work harnessed these resources and helped create the strongest economy and country in the world. We still have abundant natural resources today, and here's the good news. We may be at another tipping point, a crucial period in which we have the opportunity to change 
the energy and economic landscape of the world and to do so to our advantage. But to do that, Mr. Chairman, we need to build an energy infrastructure and we need money to do that. I hope this bill is going to contain the resources to do some of the critical things we need. Uh, I see over in the Senate the uh, highway bill has a $9 billion coming from the SPRO. Uh, we know that we used a significant amount of money from the SPRO in 21st century cures. Uh, I hope we just can avoid this robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of mentality that seems to exist around here and actually invest some money in the energy infrastructure of our country, which will pay back American taxpayers a hundredfold once we get that, that all done. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this bill uh, has some, some revenue sources in it uh, that are going to make it possible to do the work that this committee needs to do. Uh, we need to come up with cleaner and more efficient ways to use fossil fuels. Um, just because the U.S. and a handful of other countries bring more renewables into their energy portfolios, and I support that 100 percent, it doesn't mean that China or India or other countries are going to stop burning coal. So we need to find those technologies that are going to allow us to burn fossil fuels cleaner and more efficiently. Uh, we need to help usher in an energy renaissance with these new technologies. Um, this bill can be a bipartisan achievement, and I think the work of this committee so far has been an important first step. I hope we can continue the bipartisan work and tackle the other real pressing issues that we have before us. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. And at this time, the Chair recognizes the General Aide from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to start off by thanking Chairman Upton, Chairman you, um, Whitfield yourself, the ranking, mem ranking members Pallone and Rush, as well as committee staff for their hard work and willingness to work with me on modernizing our nation's electric grid and updating U.S. energy policy. I would also like to thank the co-chair of the Grid Innovation Caucus, our colleague Jerry McInerney from California, for coming across the aisle to work on a strategic transformer reserve program as well as the smart appliance and cyber sense provisions. In addition to my co-chair from California, I would also like to thank Representatives Olson, Latta, and Griffith for their continued support of the Strategic Transformer Reserve Program itself. As the co-chair of the Grid Innovation Caucus, grid security, reliability, and modernization are priorities of mine. I think this bipartisan comprehensive energy package is a step in the right direction as we begin to bring the nation's aging electric infrastructure into the 21st century. Moving forward, there are a few things I would like to see this committee take up for consideration. I believe we can further promote grid innovation technologies that enhance reliability, resiliency, and operational efficiency of the grid. Additionally, we should further encourage and protect base load energy sources to ensure that we have affordable and reliable energy. It is very important that the U.S. maintain a diverse energy portfolio and move forward with an all of the above and below approach. I would also like to revisit reliability assessments to ensure our constituents will not be harmed from the misguided federal policies that have the potential to ultimately disrupt their access to affordable and reliable electricity. We have the opportunity to provide much needed reform to the DOE's appliance standard program as well as improve the furnace provision to shield consumers from the costly and overbearing DOE mandate. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to moving this process along and updating the U.S. energy policy to unleash our full energy potential so we can ensure that our constituents receive affordable and reliable electricity. And I yield back the remainder of my time. General Lady yields back this time. I recognize the General Lady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I want to thank my colleagues for their good bipartisan work on this energy package. The last major energy bill that passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee was in 2007 when I was a freshman member of the Congress. In those days, we had our sights set on very forward-thinking energy uh, policy, and, and we focused on the changing climate. And we need to get back there to address the major challenges facing our great country. Uh, in the meantime, uh, however, this is a good bill. It's a modest one, but it's a step in the right direction. Uh, one of the most important provisions in the bill is one authored by my friend and colleague, Congressman Bobby Rush, the ranking member of the subcommittee. Uh, 
it aim, his provision aims to improve education and training for energy and manufacturing related jobs, particularly for minorities, women, and veterans. It's a bipartisan provision uh, that provides a pathway to employment for minorities and other historically underrepresented uh, communities in the energy and manufacturing sectors. We have a real challenge here. And it's important that we are proactive in this country in connecting students with the jobs of the future. Uh, his provision creates a strategy of collaboration between the federal government, industry, schools, community colleges, universities, labor unions, workforce organizations, and other stakeholders to help identify students and other candidates to enroll in training and apprenticeship programs for energy and manufacturing related jobs. In my home state of Florida, there are over 130,000 Floridians who currently work in 14,000 clean energy businesses. And in my congressional district alone, I have over a dozen solar energy companies, companies that focus on waste to energy, energy efficiency, and large electric utilities. And we need to plan for the work workforce of the future. Uh, this piece of legislation also complements the Department of Energy's SunShot initiatives, such as the Solar Inst Instructor Training Network and the Solar Ready Vets initiative. If you haven't heard about these, I hope you'll look into them. Uh, solar Instructor Training is an effort to address a critical need for high-quality local training in solar energy systems design, installation, and inspection. And we currently have over 30,000 students across the country being trained in these careers. The University of Central Florida is the leader in uh, the Southeast. And then the, I hope you'll also help us promote the Solar Ready Vets Initiative. It's currently operating at four military installations with the goal of expanding to 10 military installations. In the Tampa Bay area, not only do we have a sizable population of veterans due to the presence of McDill Air Force Base, but a fan fantastic research institution uh, at the University of South Florida, the Clean Energy Research Center. Uh, we need to unleash American ingenuity, and I hope this first step, we can build upon it in another bill to address the, the huge uh, issues facing our great country. I'll look forward to doing so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Are there other members who seek recognition? The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the great work that's been done and leading up to this markup today. Uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, Governor Bobby Jindal and I uh, co-authored a piece called Organizing for Abundance, uh, Making American Energy Superpower. And notice how close the title of this bill is to that one. Uh, we're called Architecture of Abundance. Uh, our, our writings were intended to create a 21st century American energy strategy, and I appreciate how much of that document has been incorporated in what we have today. Uh, we all know that because of the American energy re revolution, we now lead the world in oil and gas production. Uh, this improved energy security uh, translates into an improvement in our economy and also our national security. The Energy Information Administration forecast increased energy production through 2020, and that will result in increased demand for American energy jobs. Meeting these growing needs in all aspects of the energy industry, including oil and gas, nuclear, coal, and renewables, provides hard-working Americans significant opportunities for great-paying jobs, and I'm pleased to see that the 21st century uh, workforce title is included in this package. This legislation ensures that we will have the skilled workers to continue to fuel our American energy revolution for years to come, and it also provides great opportunities for America's military veterans. I commend the subcommittee's bipartisan work on this bill to date, including the opportunity for oil and gas furnace stakeholders to participate in the development of standards that receive consensus support. The Energy Department's current proposed mandate is costly and expensive to consumers, and I'm pleased that we have a path forward to ensure that this rule is fixed. Moreover, the DOE does not take into account the significant differences in heating demand in the U.S. across the country. I also look forward to our ongoing discussions regarding additional provisions that I hope we will consider during uh, full committee markup and other markups leading up to that. First, it's important that we further integrate energy markets with our friends and allies. The American energy revolution has fundamentally altered the global energy picture, and we owe American families and consumers a modernized energy policy that reflects this new reality by lifting the sanctions on the export of our domestic oil production. Why would we lift it for Iran and we don't even lift it for America's oil and gas producers? Second, 
Lifting the outdated bans on LNG and crude oil exports will enable us to sustain this energy revolution at home and bring lower overall cost and price stability for consumers. Third, I believe that we need to consider energy efficient, efficiency language and includes energy efficiency through the use of rational building codes with some necessary reforms. We need to ensure that legislation and regulations in this regard do not unnecessarily hurt America's lower income families. Fourth, any reforms would need to ensure that the Energy Department and its representatives act in a transparent manner and do not advocate on behalf of certain products or technologies essentially picking winners and losers. These codes of provisions receiving Energy Department support must also be cost effective to home buyers, particularly again, lower income home buyers and renters. Fifth, I look forward to working with uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and my colleagues on the committee as we move forward to advance and make improvements to this bipartisan bill. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and at this time, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. For uh, thank you very much, Mr. Whitfield. I also want to thank you and Mr. Rush, uh, uh, Mr. Upton, and Mr. Pallone uh, for your good leadership on this bill. And what I would call the good leadership is you inviting Republicans and Democrats to present their good ideas and encouraging us to work together. This is a good uh, first step, as you mentioned. Uh, there's a number of provisions in here that uh, I've been working on with Republican and Democratic colleagues. The Future of Industry, Pro Industry Program with Mr. McKinley, uh, Energy Efficiency Schools, uh, principally authored by Mr. Cartwright, not on this committee, but very interested in what we're doing. Energy Savings Through Public-Private pri uh, Partnership that I worked on with Mr. Kinzinger. Thank you, Adam. Uh, voluntary uh, verification programs uh, for air, uh, air, air conditioning, furnace, boiler, and heat pumps uh, that Mr. Lada has been championing. There's two things, though, I want to say. Number one, we're getting close to being self-congratulatory in an understandable way because this committee is working together. But when it comes to this challenge of a new energy future in this country, uh, Rome is burning. I mean, we've got this wild weather in Vermont. We've got droughts in California. This is a real clear and present danger. So whatever good work we're doing here is a first step. We've got an awful lot more work to do about a very serious and urgent challenge for this country. It's the climate that's being affected. And my view is that if we take this on with confidence and with boldness, we're actually going to improve the economy as we improve, um, as we improve the climate. The second thing is that I'd like to see our committee do some things that acknowledge that there is real hardship on a lot of folks that are being affected by change in the energy sector. And I have in mind more than anything else the coal workers. Uh, Mr. McKinley and I uh, have been talking about that, but the coal field workers have been getting hammered, and it's not through any fault of their own. We don't have coal in Vermont, but we have workers who are like the cold workers. They show up for work, they do their job, they didn't create climate change, they didn't institute what the policies are or the market conditions that are so devastating uh, their work. So I think one of the elements of our uh, work going forward is to recognize that even as we make change or even as market conditions impose change, we cannot leave those workers who've kept the lights on in this country behind. And I say that as somebody from a non-coal state, and I feel a real obligation in my state to help folks in other states where those coal miners have been going into those mines, help them get back on their feet, help them get their communities back strong. And I'd like to see our committee work together on that. And my view is that if we acknowledge that those workers are really important, that we can then not have this whole debate about changing energy policy being about winners and losers. We've all in America got to be winners. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Welch. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from, Ohio, from uh, Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, for three minutes. Boy, you almost messed up on that one. We have the real Oklahoma State University, the OSU, not, not the other one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Welch, I, I do appreciate those, those comments, because uh, so often that is, that is overlooked. Um, I'd like to talk just a second about this uh, architectural of abundance, which is, you know, vitally important because we need to be looking down the road. And as a proponent, as a hydropower, as a viable energy source, I hope that we can work together to ensure that the final bill includes robust hydropower reform. But most importantly, I believe this framework will only be strengthened uh, if we include in the language about lifting the outdated crude oil export ban. 
This issue is only getting a, a lot of attention because of what's going on around the world. Earlier, earlier this year, the Foreign Affairs Committee held a hearing on the global impact of the ban. A few weeks ago, the House Ag Committee uh, said that the energy costs are a strain on the ag industry, which I could tell you that is so true, suggesting that lifting the crude ban would lower fuel costs, which would only lower our costs at the grocery store. Even more, we actively discuss this issue in our committee, and, and I really appreciate that. But depending on which estimate you cite, America is now or soon will become the world's largest oil producer. This was unheard of just a few years ago. I'm concerned that the longer we wait to repeal this ban, the more risk we are at losing American jobs. Jobs are increasingly at risk the longer we wait to deliver the important issue for our states like mine. Mr. Chairman, we have a tremendous potential to increase American standing in the global energy market. Like many, I'm concerned with the current volatility uh, in the global energy market resulting in the violence and geopolitical unrest in the Middle East. With groups like ISIS now in the picture, national security issues are on the forefront of everyone's mind. We know that OPEC is artificially flooding the global market now to compete against our domestic product. What better way to go after OPEC than to be able to more freely combat their product on the global market? We're at a crossroads of uncertain future unless we act. Production is up, consumption is down, and our dependence on foreign oil is at a steady decline. Now is the time to lift this outdated crude oil export ban. I hope that we can work together to include language to lift this outdated ban as, we draft, as this draft moves forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Are there other members that would like, would like to make opening statements? If not, then uh, the chair at this point would call up the committee print and ask the clerk to report. Committee print to modernize energy infrastructure, build a 21st century energy and manufacturing workforce, bolster America's energy security and diplomacy, and promote energy efficiency and government accountability and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point uh, so ordered. Uh, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Are there any amendments to the bill? Marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> the question now occurs on forwarding the committee print to the full committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it, and the bill is favorably uh, reported. Without objection, uh, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the legislation approved by the subcommittee today. So ordered and without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. Adam, it's so good to see you today.